All right, who is Jesus? If I were to ask that, or if someone else were to ask that, would they or would you be able to answer that question? Who is Jesus? In John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And it may seem ridiculous to do a sermon on who Jesus is in front of a bunch of Christians who should already know who Jesus is. But we can always be reminded about who he is so that we remember not just who saved our souls, but that we can better tell others about who this Savior is. So I'm hoping you're having a good day today. I hope you had a good spring break. We're going to be in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Spring is here, and I don't know about you, but I am ready. I am ready for warmer days, to spend more time out in God's creation. Oh, it's going to be nice. But John 8. John 8, if you have your Bibles. We're not going to have any slides for John chapter 8. So you're going to need to be in John 8. And then from John 8, we'll look at other passages and other texts. There will be no slides from John 8. And this morning is really just going to be a sermon series in itself. In the morning, about first, who is Jesus? And then Caleb's going to fall in right behind me talking about how Jesus is this messenger. And it'll be, I'm sure it'll be really great. And what we're doing today, and we're doing it this way today, is the hope that we're introducing this new sermon series for the month of April. And it's about, as we see on the screen, seeing God through Jesus. And so I'm hoping you can be here for those, and you can grow with me as we grow to be more like Christ. But if you have your Bibles, and you're in John chapter 8, Jesus, notice here in verse 12, is talking to these people. As we all should, we, he's having conversations. We should all be having conversations. And he's in the temple where he introduces himself. And he tells the people about who he is. So I'm going to stop right there and think about that for a second. How often do we tell people about who we are as disciples? Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but you know, you don't have to know that about me. Look at what Jesus says. John 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He's quoting Isaiah 2, 9, verse 2 there. And he goes on, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And when they say that, they're right to an extent. Now, they misunderstand what Jesus is and what he's saying here, but they're right in verse, verse 13 when they say, your testimony that comes from yourself is not true because it's not from God. It's not scripture. But again, they misunderstand who Jesus is. If we want to get to know someone, we listen to them. We listen to their story. We listen to their testimony. But we don't know what they're telling us is truth. They could be exaggerating. They could be lying. We just don't know. On our podcast, The Extra Mile, comes out every Monday, wherever you get podcasts. I encourage you to listen to that. We have guests that come on and they tell us their testimony. They tell us their story. But it isn't their life story, per se. It's their testimony, their faith in God, their faith in Jesus. We know what comes from God is true. And we know if Christ comes from God, then we know what comes from Jesus is going to be truth. It's going to be truth. Look at verses 14 through 15, and that's why Jesus answers in this way. Look at verse 14. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony, he says, is true. For I know where I come from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Oh, how often is that true? Verse 15. How often do we judge according to the flesh? That is one of the biggest problems we see in our society and in our culture today is we judge according to the flesh. Whether that be in our conversations with people, how we communicate with people, the disagreements we have, or the divisions that we experience. What happens, we decide to play God and we judge other people's life and their life story before we even get to know them. We determine who they are, and we determine what they're all about by how they appear. And this is why the people that Jesus is speaking to are so frustrated, because they're judging according to the flesh. That's how they're seeing Jesus. But you see, Jesus, he sees the heart. He sees what we are about. It is so important that we take the time to listen and get to know others. Jesus is telling them, hey, listen to me, listen to him, listen to God, and take the time to get to know God. You know, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote the book of John. 
He wrote John 8, but he also wrote John 1.14. That says, the Word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. Throughout God's Word, God is wanting those that hear, those that listen, to get to know Him. The Bible is God's testimony. It's His story. And we have to choose. We have to choose. Do we believe it or do we not believe it? And if we believe it, we have to believe that it is truth. We have to. And so we sit back and we allow God to enlighten us. As it says in that same chapter, verse 9, talking about Jesus, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Remember what Jesus said in verse 12 of John 8? I am the light of the world. So what is Jesus saying here? What is he saying? What is he saying about himself? And there's two points that we want to point out here in John 8 when it comes to who Jesus is. We pick up in verse 16. John 8, verse 16. John 8, verse 16, he says, Yet even if I do judge, so my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Who sent me. If we want to know if information is true, what do we do? Right? We go to the source. We go to the source. The source can't be a place that sounds nice, a place that we think might be true. You know, it can't be that. The source, where we get our information, it has to be based on facts. It has to be based on hard evidence, not this opinionated, this biased opinions. And honestly, that should be our, our entire life, no matter the information that we grab a hold on. That should be all aspects of life. And Jesus is saying here, he's validating his words and what he does and what he says to these people in God's temple by telling them, this is where I come from. Look at verse 14, look at verse 16, and verse 18. Look at these together. Notice the common theme in each of these verses. Verse 14 says, My testimony is true, for I know where I come from and where I'm going. Jesus knows his origin. He knows his origin, but notice there, he also knows where he's going. He knows his destination. We can tell if a person is lying when all the facts aren't lining up. They're not lining up. But Jesus is saying, look, look, the facts line up. Think about that for a second. Do we know our origin and our destiny? Because our testimony of faith should include our destination. The testimony of this world doesn't have the hope that we have, doesn't have the same destination that we have, doesn't have the hope of everlasting life with God. It doesn't have that. What is the destiny of those who live in the world? Look at verse 16. Jesus goes on. Talk about the Father who sent me. Verse 18. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Now, the ESV says bear witness, like it's, like it's the 1800s, but your version may say testify. What is Jesus doing here? Jesus is saying he testifies to the Father who sent him. And notice it's the other way around, too. The Father testifies to him, the Son, Okay, I was going to look at that more tonight as he goes in the Old Testament and he, and he sees God is always pointing toward this Savior, this Savior that will come. The point here and the theme that we're seeing throughout this entire conversation is where is Jesus from? Look at verses 23 through 24 of John 8. 23 through 24. He said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. And we put so much weight, so much weight on ourselves when we attach our past and where we come from to our identity and who we are. Now, fathers, mothers, our children come from us. Be a good influence on them. Parents have such a huge influence on their, on their kids. And if they're not careful, many times they can put their own problems on their children. And the Jews here in verse 19, they say to Jesus, Who is your father? And look at verse 25. And so they said to him, again, Who are you? And Jesus said to him, Just as I've been telling you from the beginning, I'm, I'm telling you. Listen, guys, this is where I'm from. And it defines who I am. 
because I come from the I am. I come from God because, as he says in verse 23, I am not of this world. Do we tell people that we're not of this world? No. What do we tell people? I'm from New York. That's, that's who I am, a Yankee. It's a city slicker right here. I'm, I'm from Texas. I'm a Texan. I'm an American, right? I'm an American. I identify with this culture and this group of people over here. That's who I am. And those things can and they do have an impact on us. And some of it isn't bad unless it deceives us from following or seeing God in a clear light. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 11 and look at Abraham. Let's compare Abraham to the people that Jesus is speaking to. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, this is the beginning of Abraham's life here in verse 26. Look at the attitude and situation Abraham finds himself in. Genesis 11, verse 26. When Terah had lived 70 years, it says he fathered Abram, also Abraham, Norah, and Haran. Drop down. Look at verse 28. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah and the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And then it goes on to talk about his generations and to talk about his families. What was Abraham, a.k.a. Abram, attached to? His family? He lives in the city of Ur. There should be influence there. Does he allow that to define who he is? No, because of the next chapter. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. God makes a promise with him, and look at what happens here. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abram stayed in Ur. No, no, verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Big difference there. Turn back to John 8, look at verse 23. John 8, verse 23. What does Jesus say about the people that he's talking to? He says, you are of this world. You come from this world. That is your origin. That's your beginning place. Stop holding on to that. Where we come from can have such an influence on us, and it can be negative, and all of us come from the world. We all have been influenced by the world, and we deceive ourselves. If we think somehow we're okay or we are, we're safe from sin. But the thing is, if we know our destiny, the goal is to be not of this world. To set our minds on the things that are above where Jesus says he's from in verse 23. And as we read in Romans 8, verses 28 through 29, that says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. To be conformed to the image of his Son. To be conformed to the image of Jesus. That is our destiny, and in our testimony, that is our destination. Why? Because we work to please God. Because we work to please our Savior. And this is the application Jesus is making when he's talking to these people and he's introducing himself and he's telling them about who he is and where he comes from. Look at John 8, verse 29. He who sent me is with me, he says. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Are we doing things that are pleasing to God? Abraham did what was pleasing to God when he did as the Lord commanded him, and he went. Abraham knew what his life was about, and his life was about God. The people that Jesus is talking to, they're not pleasing God. They're not even doing the things that Abraham did. Notice what Jesus says here in John 8. They claim Abraham to be their father, their origin, their beginning place, and this is what Jesus says in verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to him, 
If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Verse 42. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not on my own accord, but he sent me. We read the life of Abram or Abraham, and he made some mistakes, that's for sure. But he didn't go around seeking to kill innocent men. We waste our life doing things that are not pleasing to God and only pleasing to ourselves. And in verse 42, Jesus makes this powerful statement. Look at that. It says, I come from God and I am here. I don't know how you can be any more clear than that. And yet for some reason, they're not getting it. It's not clicking. And that's why they come to this crazy conclusion. Look at verse 48. John 8, verse 48. And the Jews asked him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Whoa, back up a little bit. What is this? A demon? What kind of math is that? That doesn't even add up. That's not what Jesus has been talking about. Jesus rebukes us thinking, look at verse 49 very quickly and answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Our origin and our destination is a big part of our testimony. It's a big part of who we are. But what we do in between when our faith begins and where we end up is just as important. God changed our life and he should motivate us to do good things with our life. He should be the motivation for our life. And that is why Jesus is saying, look, I honor my Father. Jesus is honoring God on this earth. What is our response? What is our response? Because the people aren't doing that. They're dishonoring God and they're dishonoring Jesus. You know, this week, we, uh, Paige and I, it's my wife and I, we put our eight-month-old in the, in the walker. She's learning to walk, and so we put her in the walker, and, and she's just she's walking around everywhere. She's loving life. She's getting the things now that she's not supposed to get into. And, oh, man, was this a good idea? But she's happy, right? She's happy to be doing something she can't even do, really. And she's happy, and I'm happy to see her happy. And she teaches us to be thankful for things that we take for granted, blessings that we have. And I can only pray that we are a good influence on her. Ladies and gentlemen, church family, we have a responsibility to honor God with what God has given us. And he has given us so much. He has given us children and time and money and legs and moments and everything in order to honor him with. God changes our life. And all of a sudden, now we have a responsibility, a bigger responsibility, a deeper responsibility to honor him with. And when we honor him in that way, it brings us so much joy in our life, and we have so much meaning now in our life. Abraham has been kind of our human example here when it comes to this testimony of faith. Look at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, if you have your Bibles. And notice verses 1 through 3, God makes this promise here. He promise, promises a responsibility, an heir, in verses 1 through 3. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now stop right there for a second. Notice it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram. Remember, John 1, 1, 1, John 1, 1, not 1, 1, but John 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what? Was God. And what happens in Genesis 1, 15, verse 1? And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And he says what? Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. In verse 3, and Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. God wants to bless him. Look at verse 4. And behold, there it is again, the word of the Lord came to him, verse 5, and he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars. And if you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. 
and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That is a huge responsibility. A huge responsibility. You'll be the father of a great nation of my people, and from you the whole world will be blessed. He's referencing Genesis 12 there. But look at verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. It's the same God. The same God. And now we pick up, look at John 8, verse 51. John 8, verse 51. Look at Jesus here. What does he say to the Jews here in the temple? In John 8, verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, look at that again, my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Yep. Yep. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, you will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? That's the third time they're asking him. Who are you? In verse 56, look at Jesus' response. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Back up. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? When did Abraham see Jesus? The Jewish people are confused. Look at verse 57. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. That's the average lifespan at that time. And have you seen Abraham? Where in the Bible is Jesus referring here? Where is he referring to? The answer is, we don't know. We don't know. We looked at Genesis 12, we looked at Genesis 15, and those are both possibilities. But I want to turn to another possibility. We don't know if this is what Jesus is talking about, but at the very least, we can get a better understanding of who Jesus is. And Carlton brought it up, Genesis 22. Genesis 22. We would be Genesis 22, verses 1 through 3 here. God blesses Abraham with an heir. God keeps his promises. They give birth to Isaac. And it's not long before God tests Abraham's faith. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Wow, that's a faith that doesn't flinch. It doesn't. But that doesn't mean he's not brokenhearted. He, he lives his life honoring God, and I'm sure he's wondering why this is honoring. Look at verse 4. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Verse 7. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so he went both of them together. Verse 10, And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Remember what Jesus said? Abraham saw me and was glad How glad would Abraham have been to be stopped and have his son's life spared? That would have been a day he was glad to see the angel, the messenger from God, tell him, stop. And it was on that day Abraham saw God, as it says in verse 14, saw God provide. God provides a sacrifice. And when it comes to our sins... God provides a sacrifice. He provided his only son. And unlike Abraham, in our sin, we're the one that plunged the knife. Look at John 8, verse 58. John 8, verse 58, Jesus says and tells them, look, I am. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, 
before Abraham was, I am. When he says, I am, he's saying, I am God. He doesn't just say, I come from God. He finishes the conversation and says, I am. And they knew that, because look at verse 59 of John 8. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. If you remember Exodus 3, God appeared to a man named Moses with a mission to set God's people free from Egyptian slavery. And God appeared to Moses in a burning bush, and it was burning, but it wasn't being consumed by fire. And Moses saw it and was intrigued and went to it, and God called out from the bush and said in Exodus 3, 4, God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. That's almost identical to what Abraham said in uh, Genesis 22, verse 11. And when Moses asked later in the conversation, who I tell the people you are? Who are you? God says in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I sound familiar? Before Moses was, Jesus was I am. Before Abraham was, Jesus was I am. Before the creation of the earth, Jesus was I am. And Moses reluctantly still did what God said and so did Abraham, and that is my call to you this morning, is to do as Christ is saying to the believers, to abide in him and his word, to obey God. Look at what Jesus says in John 8, when he talks to the believers that believe in him. John 8, verses 30 through 32. Look at that, he says, and he was saying these things, many believed in him, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus calls us to be true disciples. That means to know God, to know your word, to love him, to obey him, and then love others, to be of God, as Jesus says in John 8, verse 47, and the truth will set you free to those who haven't accepted Jesus and what he says, Jesus talks to you in verses 33 to 36. I mean, Jesus is the, he's the truth. He can set us free. He can set you free from your past and your failures and your fears and your regrets. And they ask him, how is this that you say you will become free? And Jesus says in verse 34, truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. When we look at ourselves without Christ, and we tell people who we are, we have to say, I am, and then we fill in the blank. I am a liar. I am a murderer. I am a thief. I am a slave to sin, and the list goes on and on. But with Jesus, we are set free because of the perfect I am. Jesus hung on the cross for you. God died for you. And next to him were two thieves on their own cross. And those two thieves represent the biggest choice that you have to make in your life. And when it comes to your testimony, you can either live a life mocking him and living in your sin, or... You can accept what God provides, like the good thief. He provides salvation, and you can be with him. And if that is you this morning, and you would like to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, then come forward now, and we stand and we sing.